Thanks, Mike. And uh, thanks to the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, first of all, I have a little promo thing. Uh, we have a booth out front. Sales guy said, you got to say something about the company. So uh, I work for MedPace. Uh, MedPace is a large national CRO. Uh, international as well with uh, offices throughout Europe and other areas. Uh, the medical device division is located right here in Minneapolis and uh, uh, we focus specifically on medical device trials uh, in the U.S. and in other markets throughout the world. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about, uh, okay, you've uh, all got your money now and, uh, and what are you going to do with that money? Uh, certainly uh, some of the most critical things that are going to happen are clinical trials. And uh, there's a tendency to uh, uh, want to have those trials go quickly and cheaply and effectively and efficiently, and and uh, and a lot of times they don't. And the only thing worse than uh, spending a lot of money to run a clinical trial is uh, spending that same money again to run another clinical trial. So uh, basically, uh, when I look at this, there's three phases. You have your your first demand trials, and being a, a Minnesota company, Minnesota audience. Uh, We'll assume it's a class three cardiovascular new technology that is uh, uh, going to require clinical trials. Uh, you would have your first in man, uh, small study, limited number of patients, couple of sites, uh, prove that the device and the concept work. Uh, secondly, your safety study, uh, larger number of patients, uh, maybe not uh, fully statistical data, but certainly data that shows that the device is safe and provides you indications of efficacy. Uh, thirdly, the, the randomized controlled pivotal trial that everybody dreams about and uh, that would gain you your FDA approval, uh, hopefully gain you some level of reimbursement and uh, uh, get you into the, uh, uh, the United States market. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a, a desire to do everything at once and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, project management triangle of good, fast and cheap. Uh, pick two, and unfortunately, that is uh, normally a true analogy. Uh, when you when you do your country selection for your various trials, uh, you know obviously uh, this is not the way to do it. What I want to do is run through a few countries that uh, uh, select countries that are, are very popular, very well known for clinical trials, and talk about some of the pros and cons of each. Uh, this is some data taken off of uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, very recently, and uh, as you can tell by this, from the, the trials that are listed there, still a very large majority of the trials are, are run in the United States. Um, certainly, you know, the, the Canada and some of the European markets are, you know, they're, they're 10,000 or less uh, uh, listed trials uh, per country right now, where the U.S. is a little bit over 60,000 trials uh, listed right now. Um, as you look at country selection, um, this also shows, this is non-U.S. data uh, from, uh, and it shows that uh, although there's a, a small number of trials being run in, in Latin America right now, uh, they have a large number of patients per site. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into some Latin America things. Uh, certainly, though, uh, outside of the U.S., Western Europe is certainly dominating the, uh, the number of studies that are being run uh, uh, related to uh, devices and, and other med tech products. Uh, some of the relative costs, and this is data that uh, from the National Center for Biotechnology, so it does include both uh, devices as well as some, some med tech and pharma information. Uh, assuming the a dollar ratio of one for the United States, it does show that uh, certainly um, Japan's not on here, but I would venture to say nobody is more expensive than the United States for running a clinical trial. But certainly as you start to look at some of the, the numbers, uh, you know, uh, Australia is two-thirds the cost, uh, Argentina, uh, roughly that, uh, Germany, and interestingly enough, uh, Brazil and China, uh, very similar cost uh, related to clinical trials. And this is some of the all-in costs that include uh, uh, the time it takes to start a study and the burn rate that's involved as well as, uh, you know, it's a, uh, somewhat easier to fly to the Netherlands than it is to, uh, to fly to uh, Argentina or Brazil. 
um, down in some of the lower ends, uh, uh, India and Poland and some of the countries like that, and we'll, uh, we'll discuss India a little bit as well from a, a clinical trial standpoint. Um, the United States, uh, you know, a lot of people are uh, maybe rightly so uh, uh, negative on clinical trials in the United States, although the data would indicate it's still the, the vast, uh, uh, the largest player when it comes to clinical trials in the U.S. Uh, certainly the, the quality of researchers, the quality of physicians in the United States is beyond compare. Um, accessibility, you know, you don't have to fly to India to, to do a trial, as well as uh, the credibility of the data, not only in the, uh, the scientific community, but certainly with FDA. And although it's, it's tempting to think that uh, you don't need the U.S. market for your product, uh, you know, certainly in the ones I've been involved in, uh, by cutting the U.S. out, you're cutting out 50% of the market potential. So I think at some point, people do need to figure out how to get into the U.S. to get their product on the U.S. market. Um, some of the cons, certainly the costs. Uh, as we talked about, and other people have talked about, uh, the FDA process. Uh, I tend to agree with Mark uh, when he talked earlier about uh, the, the tide changing. I, I think there's a lot of good uh, ideas coming out of FDA right now. Certainly not too many of them put into practice yet, but uh, one of those ideas is the, uh, a guidance that came out in November where FDA is at least acknowledging the fact that they need to be compatible with first-in-man trials done in the United States, and um, hopefully that will come to fruition at some point. Um, one of the cons that uh, is, is certainly important is, is visibility. Um, you know, if you're doing a trial in the United States, it's, you know, a lot of people are going to know about it. Sometimes when you do a first-in-man trial, you kind of want to be under the radar a little bit. Um, uh, just a little bit of statistics on the FDA uh, status right now. Um, as, uh, as this shows, uh, in 2000, 76 percent of the IDs were approved first pass. That dropped to about 56 percent in 2009. Uh, last year, although the numbers aren't published, uh, I had heard somewhere in the 20 to 30 percent range. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, from folks I've talked to, some of them today even, it's like those numbers may actually be improving in the last several months uh, when it comes to ID approvals. Uh, just a little bit on some of the statistics, we'll go through these rather quickly. Um, PMA review times, which are uh, largely regulated, uh, certainly have uh, had reached a peak and are, are dropping down, certainly not to historical levels, but uh, review times do seem to, to be on the right trend. Um, from a 510K standpoint, uh, not so much. Um, the, uh, the numbers are certainly much greater than they were even a decade ago and possibly, possibly stabilizing, but uh, I think the, the new statistics will, will prove if that's the impact or not. Certainly with some of the regulations that are being proposed and, and possibly introduced in the next year or two, you know, those numbers may certainly even get worse. Um, a lot of that's due to requests for information, and this is a slide that shows just the additional requests for information on 510Ks and how it's up, uh, you know, twofold over the last uh, decade or so. Um, uh, European trials, uh, using European sites for clinical trials, uh, certainly that's a, a, a number one priority, I think, for most of the companies now as they, as they develop their device. Uh, uh, with MedPace uh, in the device group, fully half of our trials, our first-in-man trials, and our early clinical trials are run in Europe. Um, again, uh, you know, good quality researchers, uh, relatively ease of access, uh, a lot of, uh, of, of well-known uh, centers that uh, people have worked with and know how to negotiate. Uh, some of the cons, the, the costs, although there's currently less than the United States, they're still somewhat high and uh, increasing um, over time. Uh, some of the times the startups in Europe, uh, uh, I've had occasions where actually I've been able to start U.S. sites quicker than European sites, uh, depending on the location of that site. Um, within Europe, there's a, a variety of different regulations. You have European norms that regulate clinical trials. Uh, there's med devs, which are guidance documents that regulate clinical trials, as well as, uh, uh, although there's a common regulatory approval with the CE mark, uh, 
uh, clinical trials are still managed at the country level, so you've got 28 different sets of uh, country requirements to deal with when you, when you do clinical trials within Europe. Uh, also, too, uh, uh, as outside of the United States, some vary in standard of care. Uh, different medications approved, different uh, treatment regimes, regimens, um, you know, different standards of care for heart failure and PTCA and uh, things like that. Uh, Australia is uh, certainly a, a country of interest for clinical trials. Uh, relatively low cost, uh, relatively low regulatory barriers to get in to start a trial, uh, very good researchers, um, and uh, uh, very uh, credible data when it comes to uh, peer-reviewed journals and, uh, and FDA. Uh, some of the cons, uh, certainly the distance, you know, it takes, uh, it takes a couple of days to get there. Um, not always a huge patient population depending on the on the disease and the treatment that you're looking at. And again, uh, outside of the United States, sometimes the, the different standards of care, different treatment regimens for, for different diseases that, that may or may not relate to the United States when you get to the point of uh, uh, doing an FDA submission. Uh, just a little bit of data on India. As we talked earlier, although there's not a lot of trials going on in India relative to the United States right now, certainly a, an area of growth with uh, you know, almost a quadrupling of trials predicted by, uh, by next year. Um, some of the, the, the advantages of India, certainly uh, uh, the cost, the cost structure is, is much less than the United States. Uh, there's a, a lot, of, lot of people, a, lot of, a large population, so there's a lot of potential patients for your studies. Uh, very motivated researchers and some very good research sites in different areas, uh, escorts and some of these other large centers that have our you know, state-of-the-art equipment and, and fully staffed, fully trained personnel. Um, and some of the uh, disadvantages, though, and, and some of these can't be ignored, um, it, the, the use of the data. Uh, one of the things that FDA always says is they accept foreign data as long as it relates to the U.S. population, uh, proving that the data you collect in, in some of these countries does relate to the U.S. population can be a challenge at times. Um, some of the regulatory barriers, uh, India has relatively new regulations as it relates to medical devices, and these do uh, lead to some uncertainty and some delays as well in uh, getting device uh, trials started. Uh, secondly, um, for a class three device, if you're exporting to a tier two country, and that's anything basically outside of Europe, Japan, Canada, South Africa, Israel, uh, you have to file a 801E2 with FDA, which is basically a small IDE, and it gets reviewed by the, the, the same group that would do your device review rather than the compliance group. Um, China is a, another interesting target. Uh, certainly, uh, their cost structure is very favorable. Uh, this is an example of a, a clinical uh, for a drug study. Uh, earlier on, we talked about their costs for device trials being roughly 50 percent. Uh, in this drug study, it was almost a, a 10 percent difference. Uh, some of the things that relate is, uh, you know, the, the one-day hospitalization and an MRI uh, being relatively, you know, 10 percent of the cost of what they are in the United States. Um, some of the advantages and disadvantages to China, again, uh, uh, the, the costs are uh, a good driver, the, the large patient population. Uh, they have some very good, well-qualified and, and well-staffed research centers within China. Uh, again, some of the same issues as we discussed with India. The, uh, the, the use of the data uh, it, with FDA and with the United States and, and proving that it does relate to a, an American population. Uh, some different regulatory barriers. Uh, it can take six to 12 months to get a clinical trial started in China. Uh, there's normally going to be a requirement that you have some testing done within China and that you run a minimum of at least two clinical sites within China. Uh, same export issues uh, related to uh, to FDA as well. Uh, Latin America is a, a, another very interesting target. Uh, as we saw earlier, there's a large number of uh, uh, patients per site in, in Latin American enrollment in trials. 
this is a cardiac surgeon in uh, Paraguay who uh, uh, has, has some uh, uh, notoriety lately for uh, doing large uh, numbers of patients for startup trials. Although clinicaltrials.gov only shows uh, 12 studies currently being executed in Paraguay. Uh, some of the, the pros and cons for Latin America are, are very similar to uh, what we talked about with uh, uh, China and India. So um, just kind of in summary, as, as you're designing these clinical trials, it's uh, very tempting to try and have, have all trials meet all needs. And uh, what I'd recommend is that your first in man trials, we said before, a small study, uh, limited number of patients, uh, certainly consider a, a tier one country, US, Europe, Australian site. When it comes to the safety trial, uh, you know, 30 to 50 patients, primarily European sites, one of the goals of this is to gain the CE mark as well as to, uh, in, uh, by working with FDA in advance of the execution of this trial, have this satisfy the, the feasibility phase requirement for FDA. You don't necessarily have to run the trial in the United States, but run it to a protocol that they've at least reviewed through the pre-ID process. And then the pivotal trial, certainly uh, large, randomized, statistically powered, uh, primarily U.S. sites, but certainly using some of the sites that you maybe had for your safety study as well to uh, uh, continue that uh, involvement. Um, and then the result of this is the FDA approval uh, marketing uh, information as well as hopefully reimbursement. So uh, just in summary, um, you know, design your trials in a stepwise progression, uh, very thoughtful uh, country and site selection based on the phase of your trial, and uh, don't regard, uh, ignore the, the regulatory uh, considerations for those studies. Thank you.